Uh, so thank you, Michael, very much for that. Uh, I didn't have my uh, headphones on when he made that introduction, but I think I caught the getting to Denmark part of it. Uh, I must say that um, I had never been uh, to Denmark or even to Scandinavia before Michael invited me uh, here to Aarhus. Uh, and then for three years I was a visiting professor. It was a wonderful three years. Uh, I met some really terrific colleagues uh, that I still uh, feel very close to and uh, uh, quite a number of students. And so when uh, he mentioned that there was this conference on the Reformation, I jumped at the chance to come back. So I'm really uh, delighted to be here and to resume our friendship, Michael. So thank you very much for that. Uh, so the topic uh, of the Reformation is one that I've actually thought quite a lot about. Uh, my real interest in the last few years has been on the question of political development, meaning where do political institutions come from? And modern political institutions were shaped decisively by events that happened in the 16th century, uh, meaning that they came out of the Reformation. So what I'm going to talk about is the impact of this movement uh, in three respects. The first has to do with how the Reformation shaped the growth of modern states. The second has to do with Luther in particular and his relationship to the concept uh, of identity, which I believe is a modern concept and which very much uh, shapes the way we look at our world uh, today. And then the third topic is how the Reformation uh, inadvertently led to the rise of modern liberalism uh, because there is a connection there, but it was one that was never uh, planned by either Luther or Calvin uh, or Melanchthon or any of the founders of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, before I get into the first of these issues, the modern state, uh, I need to distinguish, I know the emphasis because this is the 500th anniversary of the 95 Theses, the emphasis at this conference has been very heavily on Martin Luther, but there were in fact two important phases to the Protestant Reformation. So the first one begins in 1517 uh, and goes up through the, let's say, 1547 uh, when the Schmalkaldic League is defeated by the Emperor Charles V. So this is a period in which uh, Lutheranism uh, spreads. Uh, it spreads through preachers and sermons on a grassroots level, but the territorial gains uh, of Lutheranism uh, are really due to princes that decide to take their, uh, their principalities into Lutheranism. Uh, and so you get uh, the entire conversion of a, uh, a whole society uh, from the top down. The second phase begins when the Catholic Church regains its composure. It had been very disorganized. The empire had been very disorganized in the 1520s, 30s, and 40s, but by the 1540s, uh, there's a defeat, a military defeat of the Protestant princes in Germany. Uh, the Council of Trent uh, begins in uh, 1545. Uh, uh, the Catholics at this point decide that they're not going to try to negotiate uh, a resolution of the doctrinal issues with the Protestants, that they will stick to a, a pure form of their doctrine, the, the Society of Jesus, of St. Ignatius Loyola is founded in the 1550s. It's a very militant uh, wing of crusading uh, Catholicism. And so Catholicism makes a political comeback uh, throughout uh, uh, the emperor, throughout uh, Latin Europe. And this is the moment that John Calvin establishes his uh, Protestant Republic in Geneva. And Calvinism spreads not through the power of princes, so much as on a grassroots level through its ability to organize individual congregations. It spreads through France with the Huguenot movement. It spreads to the Netherlands. It goes to England. Uh, so it actually leaps territorially into uh, very different uh, and sometimes uh, at that point peripheral parts of Europe. But it meets the resistance of an organized Catholicism. And so Calvinism is not as powerful politically as the early uh, Lutheran states. They organize in opposition, and that very much affects the, uh, the effect that they had on uh, subsequent uh, political development. So let me begin with the first of the topics, which is the impact of the Lutheran phase of the Reformation on the growth of a modern state. 
Uh, a modern state, uh, if you consult my book uh, that Michael referred to, uh, Political Order and Political Decay, has, three, uh, has, has several important elements. It is a monopoly uh, of force, of power, uh, over territory that is regarded as legitimate. But there's a very important difference between uh, a modern state and a patrimonial state. A modern state seeks to be impersonal. Uh, generally speaking, it is ruled by a centralized bureaucracy that is capable of imposing uniform rules uh, impersonally on citizens simply because they are citizens. A patrimonial state, a pre-modern state, uh, is one in which your personal relationship with the ruler determines your status. Uh, you have a lot of inherited privileges, and no state in Europe in the year 1500 uh, was a modern state. Uh, sovereignty was divided between a king and various territorial lords. These lords were not even sovereign over their territories because there was sub-infeudation. Uh, there was a theory of the two crowns, and so no European monarch would have said, I am an absolute sovereign, because they would have said, God is sovereign. God is sovereign through his representative on earth, which is the Pope and the universal Catholic Church uh, in Rome. And so there was a fundamental transnational, there was a division of sovereignty between territorial lords, uh, very decentralized, uh, and a transnational body, uh, which was the Catholic Church. Territories were not contiguous, so as a result of dynastic marriages, conquests, acquisitions, uh, a particular king could rule over uh, territories like Prussia from Cleves and Mark in western Germany all the, way to, uh, all the way to East Prussia. Now, the first way in which the Protestant Reformation led to the growth of modern states was simply a material one. Many princes in Europe grabbed the, the property of the church uh, and kept it for themselves. Uh, this, of course, happened in the princely states in Germany, like uh, the Saxony of Frederick the Wise that we, we saw portrayed yesterday in the, in the opera. Uh, but this was really characteristic of, uh, of Scandinavia as well, uh, Denmark and uh, uh, Sweden. Um, uh, Professor Kaufman yesterday went over a lot of that history, so I don't want to rehearse it, but this process really begins in the 1520s with uh, with Christian II, who is not con converted to Lutheranism. He simply wants to nationalize the Catholic Church uh, in, the in, his, uh, in his territories. And so he does this by uh, beginning to appoint his own uh, uh, appointees to ecclesiastical uh, positions and taking the, that appointment power uh, away from Rome. Uh, then uh, his nephew, Frederick I, the next king, is kind of neutral on doctrine, but he permits Lutheran preachers to spread through Denmark. This is the moment, I think, at which Danish society itself, at a grassroots level, begins to convert uh, to the new religion. And then, of course, uh, in 1536, at the end of the Count's War, uh, Christian III uh, turns the country into the first uh, Lutheran uh, principality in Europe. He had experimented with this in Holstein as Duke, uh, creating a princely state, a princely Lutheran state, and he applies those lessons to Denmark as a whole. Uh, so it is a very top-down affair. At that point, perhaps one-third of the land in Denmark had been owned by the Catholic Church. In Norway, apparently about half of the land was, was the property of the church. Uh, Christian III had run up huge debts as a result of the Count's War. He was broke, like many uh, pre -mo uh, early modern monarchs. He needed revenues, and there was a clear revenue source uh, that he could grab. Something very similar is done by Gustavus Vasa in, uh, in Sweden uh, as a result of the Swedish, I don't know how it's referred to in Denmark, but their war of independence from Denmark. Uh, he runs up a lot of debts, uh, and he again sees these church properties. Uh, he doesn't seem to have any particular interest in Lutheranism as a doctrine, but he sees that it's a convenient excuse to grab the property uh, of the church, and he uh, does so. Uh, there, the resistance is stronger because there hadn't been as much grassroots support for Lutheranism, and so you get these conservative peasant rebellions uh, in favor of the old church that uh, uh, recur in, in Sweden, and so it takes a much longer time for Lutheranism to be uh, consolidated there than in 
uh, Denmark. In England, you see uh, really the process of modern state building being directly uh, connected to the creation of a national uh, Protestant uh, English church. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, Henry VIII had no interest in Lutheranism. He didn't like all the preachers from Wittenberg particularly, uh, but he wanted to get a divorce and the Pope wouldn't give it to him, so he basically took the entire uh, Catholic Church uh, property and nationalized it. Uh, again, something like 20% of all the land in England was owned by the church, a lot of the movable wealth, uh, the taxes, that, uh, the tithe that went uh, from uh, Catholic parishes to Rome, all of a sudden began going to the uh, English exchequer. Uh, the process, G.R. Elton, the, the uh, historian G.R. Elton has made a, an argument that actually the modern uh, English state was born uh, under the uh, secretaryship of Thomas Cromwell, uh, Henry VIII's great uh, minister who devised a bureaucratic system for managing all of these ecclesiastical taxes that the church had collected but which were now going to the English exchequer. There had to be an administrative system. It used to be the case that uh, the king would ask for taxes only when he needed to fight a war, but from the 1540s on, the English state would collect uh, taxes regularly. And increasingly, the administration of this taxation and revenue system was independent of the king. It was run by a permanent bureaucracy, which meant that the king and, and achieving kingly power was, was simply less important, which had an important effect on the growth of this impersonal, uh, this impersonal state. The other thing that was going on in England, and, and this was really happening in all of the new Protestant principalities in this period, was the development of a distinct uh, national identity uh, as a result of the change in the language that was used because vernacular Bibles were being uh, introduced uh, in all of these places and because there was a distinctive Protestant worship service that was very diff different from the Catholic ritual. I will read you a, um, a paragraph from a historian, an English historian, talking about the impact by the late, uh, uh, later part of the Tudor dynasty uh, of how English national identity had shifted. The feeling of national identity and uniqueness continued to grow reaching an apogee in the reign of Elizabeth when it was given classic expression in one of the most influential works of the whole English literature. John Fox's Acts and Monuments was a resounding statement of the theory that Protestant England was God's elect nation superior to the enslaved papists of the continent and entirely independent of all authority except uh, from that of the crown. Uh, this was a theory of the English and later British nationhood, which would prevail from then onwards until the 1970s, when membership in the European community once more subjected the country to decisions of an external authority. Uh, of course, that period of enslavement to external authority was very brief with the Brexit vote. They're now out of that, uh, and they've returned to being uh, an independent, uh, uh, happy green island, uh, apart from uh, apart from the rest of Europe. So this is a simple material sense in which the Lutheran Reformation led to modern states. Uh, states are dependent on resources and the size and the administrative capacity of European states simply grew because they took over uh, tax collection functions and uh, simple property uh, from the church. It also involved other social functions and so poor relief had been administered by various church bodies and uh, over the next couple of centuries these increasingly um, get absorbed into the state itself uh, which then lays the basis for the 20th century, for this 20th century welfare state. All right, the second respect in which uh, the Reformation uh, affected state building was during the Calvinist phase. Now, uh, there's a lot of studies led by economists these days about corruption and what are the sources of corruption. So this is the, you know, this is the essence of getting to Denmark because in all of the international measures of political corruption, Denmark is always, you know, at the top of the list. Denmark, Norway, Singapore, you know, they, they trade places, but they're always at the top of the list. 
and the question is how uh, how do you get uh, how do you get up there? The current economy uh, economic theory is so-called principal agent theory, which says that corruption happens when a principal delegates power to an agent or a series of agents, and then the agents follow their own self-interest rather than the interest of the principal. And so according to The Economist, the way you fight corruption is by aligning the incentives of the agent with that of the principal. This theory works uh, under many conditions, except when the principal himself is corrupt. If the principal is corrupt and is stealing uh, from the public treasury and has no concept of public interest but only of self-interest, then the whole system breaks down and you have systemic corruption, which unfortunately is the situation in uh, very many uh, developing and transitional uh, countries. And it means that you have to explain how it is that certain countries end up with principles, meaning the king, president, the prime minister, who is personally not corrupt and is interested in running the country for the sake of uh, public interest, a common public interest, rather than uh, his own or his family's. And this is where Calvinism, uh, I think, played an important role. There's a book by uh, Philip uh, Gorski, who's a sociologist at Yale, called The Disciplinary uh, Revolution, where he explores this mechanism in two uh, important countries, the Netherlands and in Prussia. In the Netherlands, the disciplinary revolution was a decentralized one. Uh, the Dutch, as you're well aware, fought an 80-year war with the empire, uh, with Spain, basically. The Spanish would use their base in Milan, send troops up the Spanish road uh, to the Low Countries, uh, and the United Provinces had to fight over a very prolonged period uh, to retain their uh, independence. They had no modern what we would identify as a modern state apparatus, no centralized bureaucracy, they had no powerful king, they had a stadtholder, but one that was relatively weak by, by European standards. Uh, what they did have was extremely powerful grassroots organization in a series of local congregations, uh, consistories, that would discipline individual members of the congregation, would raise taxes, would uh, provide fortifications and the like, uh, and Gorski gives some really remarkable uh, historical comparative statistics that the Low Countries had much lower rates of crime than did contemporaneous uh, Paris uh, or London, but what's really remarkable is its ability to tax its own uh, people. In Spain and France, where taxation fell heavily on the peasantry, generally speaking, those monarchies couldn't uh, extract more than about 10% of total uh, GDP, what we would call GDP today uh, in, in the form of taxes. In Holland, that number was about 30% because the taxation was done on a local level and it was done with a kind of legitimacy where wealthy Dutchmen would give money to build ships for their navy uh, because they understood that there was a direct relationship between taxation and the security of uh, their uh, society, and Gorski argues that this was very much shaped by a Calvinist austerity that made public officials understand that they were serving a broader public interest uh, and not simply their own. So both in terms of personal morality and in the terms of the morality of public officials, uh, he argues that Calvinism uh, had a very big impact. The other country where you have Calvinism playing a rather interesting role is in Prussia. Prussia, of course, was the home of the original model of modern bureaucracy. When Max Weber wrote about bureaucracy, he was really thinking about German bureaucracy, which was inherited from the Prussians. Uh, this tradition, this bureaucratic tradition, begins with the great elector at the end of the Thirty Years' War. He doesn't demobilize his army. Uh, he begins to set Prussia on this path of state centralization. What is interesting is that the Hohenzollern family, the dynasty running Brandenburg and later Prussia, were Calvinists in a largely Lutheran society. They did not trust the local Lutheran nobility, and as a result, when they built their bureaucratic machine, they imported a lot of French Huguenots uh, and Dutch Calvinists to actually be their administrators. Uh, this is a very typical pattern in a modern administrative system. You don't want to let 
your administrators marry into the local uh, elites because that's the source of corruption. They have to maintain autonomy and a certain distance. And Prussia creates the first modern autonomous bureaucracy because it's a bunch of Calvinists operating uh, in a largely Lutheran society. Friedrich Wilhelm I, the first Friedrich Wilhelm uh, of Prussia who ruled in the early 18th century was an unbelievable disciplinarian. He once whipped and jailed his son, Frederick, who would go on to be uh, Frederick the Great, Frederick II. Uh, he turned his palace uh, into a parade ground. Uh, he cut the salaries of all of his bureaucrats. He fired uh, half of them. If he saw any hint of corruption in the bureaucracy, it would be punished uh, by execution. Uh, and he himself was extremely upright uh, and austere, uh, and he set the tone for the entire bureaucracy that then survived uh, the subsequent uh, shifts in Prussian history, I think establishing both a tradition of austerity, which I think we be I believe we still see among Germans, uh, and uh, also the, the uh, tradition of uh, independent and autonomous public service as uh, a special kind of calling, and this was, I think, very much related to the Calvinism uh, of the Owenzollern uh, family. Uh, so this, this is the, you know, this is the second, uh, this is a set of examples that show that both of the wings of the Protestant Reformation played a role in creating modern states. Now, there's lots of other reasons why you have modern states. There's uh, political competition, military competition in particular, and so it turned out that the Catholic states in Europe, in order to survive, also had to modernize, and so it's not the case that the only modern states that emerged were, uh, were Protestant ones. The French, of course, created a very modern bureaucracy after uh, Napoleon, and then this became a generalized pattern. But without the Reformation, I think the initial impetus uh, to state modernization uh, would, not, would not have been there. Now, the second issue that I think links the Reformation to modernity is this question of identity. Uh, identity is the belief that there is an authentic self hidden inside me that is not fully revealed, uh, which I myself may not actually recognize, that is different from the kind of external uh, social role that I am being forced to play by my surrounding society. Uh, Professor Kaufman used the, the term identity when talking about the Christians fighting the Turks in the 16th century. Uh, you can use the term identity in that sense, but I think in the modern sense, if you're simply fighting an external enemy of a different religion over there, uh, that's not the same as this belief that I have an identity that is hidden inside me and everybody around me does not share that identity, does not know it, does not recognize it, uh, and does not appreciate it. And that's the modern sense of identity that I think begins with Martin Luther. It begins with Luther because of his distinction between uh, the inner and the outer man. Uh, so, of course, Lutheranism is based on this idea of inner grace. Uh, in, the, uh, in, his, in his pamphlet, The Freedom of a Christian Man, Luther says the following. He says, no external thing has any influence in producing Christian righteousness or freedom. Faith alone can rule only in the inner man, as Romans 10.10 10 says, for man believes with his heart and so is justified. And since faith alone justifies, it is clear that the inner man cannot be justified, freed, or saved by any outer work or action at all, and that these works, whatever their character, have nothing to do with this inner man. Now, this concept of inner and outer also corresponded to Luther's own personal struggle, because as an Augustinian monk, he was trying to come to terms with his own uh, sinfulness, uh, his own lack of uh, faith. He struggled with this over a number of years, and I think did not understand this interiority uh, of faith uh, until a moment of revelation which then led to uh, his uh, revolt against the Catholic Church. 
This is a modern sense of identity because what Luther was saying is that freedom, human freedom, the dignity of a Christian individual is only something on the inside. It is not visible by any external act uh, of that individual. And it is certainly not visible in the external rituals of an institution like the Catholic Church. And furthermore, the value, the, the true moral value, lies in that inner person and not in the outer ritual. So the entire society can be false uh, and corrupt, uh, but the inner person can still be saved. And so this is the moment at which the inner person achieves uh, a unique value and is the source, uh, I think, of human freedom. So Luther, uh, distinguish between inner and outer. That's the beginning point of a modern concept of identity. It's not, however, the modern concept because he only understood freedom in one dimension, which was the freedom to accept God or not. There was a kind of binary decision that one could make uh, and one was free to make it. That was the source of human dignity, but you couldn't decide, well, I'm gonna become a Hindu or I'm gonna come out of the closet as a, as a gay or a lesbian. I mean that wasn't an open choice. There was really uh, uh, you know, a, a very um, distinct uh, a moral world or moral universe in which Luther operated. But the distinction between inner and outer then lays the groundwork for the subsequent secularization of the concept and its evolution uh, into what we recognize as modern uh, identity politics. The next thinker that I think was critical in taking that concept and generalizing it was Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, Rousseau, uh, as you're probably aware, in the discourse on the origins of human inequality, argues that man in the state of nature, uh, the original uh, human being, was actually timid, isolated, uh, fearful, uh, but happy because uh, he could feel the sentiment of his own existence, was not full of emotions like envy, pride, shame that came from comparing oneself to other people in society, and that human unhappiness began to originate when people began living with one another, could compare themselves to other people, and decide that they were worse off, and this was, he said, the source of human enslavement. And so you have the same distinction between inner and outer. The inner person is an innocent, savage in a certain sense, and the outer person is the French aristocrat or you know, whatever that is uh, conforming to the rituals of the court whose social persona is masking and suppressing uh, the inner freedom that every one of us uh, is born with. And Rousseau's two solutions to this, one was political through the social contract. If everybody could join in a single general will, uh, then there would be no contradiction between the inside and the outside. Uh, his private solution was to return as an individual to the state of nature through the experience of his own uh, sentiment of uh, existence. Uh, but this then <laughs> sets the groundwork for many subsequent thinkers in the 19th and 20th centuries that would take this concept of inner and outer, the inner freedom of the individual that was the authentic freedom and the outward ritual that was the false suppression of that uh, inner being. In Kant, you know, in, in a certain sense, uh, you have another effort to secularize the Lutheran idea uh, where human freedom you know, for Kant is not uh, the freedom to accept God, it's the freedom to accept the, the categorical uh, imperative. It's a rule that's derived from reason uh, that exists uh, simply as, a, as an artifact of reason uh, alone. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, these ideas move in two different directions. So one is towards a much more expansive view of freedom towards uh, you know, what we would call uh, today expressive individualism, that our true freedom is a kind of artistic creativity that is uh, suppressed by the outside society, so we're all incipient. Beethoven's or Van Gogh's, uh, we just don't know it, you know, until we are able to realize our, uh, our true selves. But the other important direction that it goes in is towards modern nationalism. Uh, Johann Gottfried Herder, in a way, picks up 
this idea of the inner self, but he says that inner self is a collective self. Uh, he says that every nation, every tribe, every group of people adapts to its circumstances. Every single nation has its own genius that is the product of climate and geography and uh, its local history. And that identity, that collective identity, uh, is being suppressed by the outside political world. In his case, he was thinking about you know, the German states that all were uh, uh, imitating the, the French court at Versailles, adopting all these French manners, uh, not regarding you know, their authentic German folk culture, uh, and therefore authenticity involved the recovery of that, uh, of that genuine folk culture. Now, it is of course extremely unfair to link Luther to the rise of this aggressive German nationalism in the late 19th and uh, early 20th century, but there is a connection. Uh, there is, you know, without doubt, a connection. The most obvious connection is simply through language. I believe uh, it was said, you know, in, in, the, in the discussions uh, yesterday that language was very important. The Luther Bible really standardized a form of vernacular German that really uh, survives up until uh, the present. Uh, it is through language, a vernacular language, that Germans began to realize that even though they were living in separate political units, that they still had uh, a, cultural, uh, a cultural unity. And obviously, the uptake of Lutheranism in the German lands was a kind of proto-nationalism. The Germans did not like being ruled by a Burgundian emperor and an Italian pope. Uh, they wanted, you know, ruled by German princes over uh, German subjects. And so, in a sense, the idea of a, you know, a single German nation based on culture rather than dynasty uh, really uh, gets a big start uh, in the Lutheran uh, Reformation. And then, of course, in the 19th and 20th centuries goes in very different directions because everybody in Europe comes to this realization that they've got an authentic nation that is being suppressed by the Austro-Hungarian and Turkish and other, uh, other empires. All right, so the last issue that I want to address is the question of modern liberalism and the Reformation's impact. And here, the impact is a completely unintended one. Um, I think it's pretty clear that neither Luther nor Calvin were liberals in anything like a modern uh, sense. By liberal, I mean somebody that believes that individuals are born with natural human rights, that uh, governments are instituted uh, to protect those rights, that governments gain their legitimacy by the extent to which they guarantee uh, a degree of individual freedom, including uh, the freedom to own property. Uh, Luther was perfectly happy to attach his doctrine uh, to princely power. Uh, John Calvin in Geneva basically ran a theocratic dictatorship in which there is no uh, tolerance for any kind of doctrinal uh, deviation. Uh, and in fact, that same discipline, Calvinist discipline, led to a lot of suppression uh, and, and fighting you know, between Protestant sects uh, as, uh, as time went on. The connection to liberalism really comes out of the 150 years of war that was unleashed by the Reformation. You had major civil wars in the Netherlands, in France, in England, uh, and then, of course, in Germany culminating in the Thirty Years' War that killed perhaps a third of the population uh, of, much of, southern, uh, much of southern Germany. Uh, if you look at the specific origin of modern liberal theory, a lot of it comes out of England and out of the English Civil War. Uh, you know, as you know, England went in and out of Catholicism several times. Uh, this issue only gets resolved in 1689 uh, in the Glorious uh, Revolution. Thomas Hobbes writes his treatise Leviathan in the early 1650s, uh, a few years after the beheading of Charles I and the establishment of Oliver Cromwell's uh, protectorate. So England had been consumed by an extremely bloody civil war uh, in the previous years. Thomas Hobbes says, rights do not come, they're not inherited, they're not feudal, uh, they're natural. Uh, they're natural because the most basic human passion is the fear of violent death. Uh, we have the right to kill any other human being in the state of nature. We give up that right when we enter into civil society 
and the sovereign, uh, the Leviathan, uh, is the individual who guarantees us our right to life. That is the basis of legitimacy. Uh, and that is the reason that a liberal society is basically an aggregation of these individual rights. John Locke uh, takes that doctrine and says, well, the state itself can threaten those, that right to life, and therefore people have a right of rebellion against unjust authority. John Locke becomes the chief ideologist of the glorious revolution that unseats the Catholic uh, James II. England, from that point on, has parliamentary sovereignty uh, and is a Protestant uh, nation based on this, uh, based on this uh, understanding of a, of a constitutional compact guaranteeing the right to life. In 1776, Thomas Jefferson in North America pens the American Declaration of Independence, which begins, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That right to life in the Declaration of Independence owes its ancestry directly to Thomas Hobbes, who was reacting to the religious strife that was visited on England by the religious wars uh, of the 17th century. And so the American democratic system, in many ways, is the product of the wars of religion in, uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, and, well, the rest is history. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, this doctrine becomes very powerful because it's also very good for economic development because the right to property uh, is also uh, guaranteed. But this was not an intended consequence of any of the founders of the Protestant Reformation. They did not want liberal, tolerant societies. They wanted societies that pursued the good life, the good life being defined by religion. Uh, there was a deliberate lowering of the horizon of politics so that it strove not for the good life, but for life itself. You wanted simply a system that would allow people to live in peace because that was what uh, was the most important human value. And that's the kind of society, you know, in our modern liberal democracies that we have. It's not devoted to, to ends defined by religion. Uh, it is defined by certain basic rights that we believe are shared by all human beings. I'll just conclude with this thought. So right now in the Middle East, there is an ongoing civil war uh, between Sunnis and Shiites. Uh, some commentators say that this is a centuries-old war. This is nonsense. Sunnis and Shiites have actually been living pretty peacefully up until the last few years, but now this war is spreading. Uh, it's driven by Saudi Arabia and Iran and their local uh, um, rivalry. Uh, and many people will say, well, there's no uh, precedent in the world of Islam for liberalism. There's no doctrine of separating church and state. There's no doctrine of tolerance, of religious tolerance or religious freedom. I think what people need to recognize is that in the Christian West, for many years, there was also no uh, doctrine of religious tolerance, and there was a complete fusion of religious power and princely power. And that the reason that we have modern liberalism is that Europe found itself in a bloody civil series of civil wars over a period of 150 years, and at the end of that, uh, certain thinkers said, okay, enough. You know, we have to take religion out of politics. We need uh, liberal tolerance because that's the only way that people in a de facto sectarian society can simply exist. Uh, and I think that in the Muslim world, they haven't come to that realization yet. I hope that in that part of the world it doesn't take 150 years of violence. Uh, I think actually there's an argument that things will speed up <laughs> in the modern world because people learn lessons uh, a little bit more quickly uh, than they did in the 16th, 17th centuries. Uh, but I think that this, you know, in a certain sense is a ground for hoping that the European precedent of religious intolerance producing liberal tolerance may play itself out uh, in another critical part of the world. So how have I done on time? Well, we've got one minute. <laughs> so thank you very much uh, for your attention.